and we should be recording now. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ivailo Petrov, and uh, I will be uh, kicking off this COSI interim meeting. This is an official ITF meeting, and as such, the note will apply. Uh, if you are not familiar with it, please read it carefully uh, before engaging in any uh, conversation and other contributions. And this is the agenda for today. We will be uh, looking at some uh, document status and uh, we will spend the bunch of the time uh, with certificates, uh, CBOR encoding, and uh, probably discuss a few more things along the way. Uh, is there any bashing to this agenda? I will take that as a no. So, uh, the minutes uh, can be found here. Uh, we will be uh, taking a look at them with Mike, uh, but please do uh, contribute. And uh, if there are any action items uh, connected to you, please make sure that they are correctly represented in the minutes. Uh, so, as a reminder, the attendance and the uh, meeting are recorded. And with that, that let's, let's move to the uh, document status. Yeah. Mike, uh, do you want to say something? Or Uh, so, yes, as you uh, should be already aware, the rechartering has completed and uh, now uh, the CBOR uh, certificate encoding is officially part of our charter. Uh, we was uh, working on some additional algorithms. Uh, then uh, I saw that there was some uh, progress uh, with the uh, hash outs and uh, these documents. Uh, they uh, should be in the final stages of the uh, editor's editing, so we uh, should be looking at the old uh, 48. Uh, quite soon, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, have them published uh, uh, in the next, uh, I don't know, few weeks, hopefully, depending on the load of the RFP editor. What, what happened is uh, pretty interesting. Um, the, the RFC editor has a number of uh, states in which documents can be, and they have a state progression uh, mechanism. And uh, in this case, they managed to get these three drafts uh, wedged against each other in such a way that only manually pressing a button for a state progression could unwedge them. So sometimes you have to, to look at documents that are in the RFC editor queue and see whether they, they got wedged in, in any particular way and, and um, alarm the RFC editor, and th they are getting better in this, but uh, some of the process st steps are still manual, and uh, they can really get stuck indefinitely. So if, if you don't pay attention, uh, it may, may take a long time before it finally advances again. But we, we are beyond that now. Okay. Well, thanks, Karsten, for pointing this out. I was not aware of, uh, I was not aware of it, so... Yeah, that is uh, useful. Uh, 
Okay, uh, so then for the counter sign, uh, we had a new version of the draft that uh, should be uh, addressing the points from uh, the Shepherd write up. Uh, I'm not aware of any other issues. Uh, so I think the next step would be for the draft to be uh, reviewed by uh, Ben. So yes, we will uh, coordinate yeah, to make sure that uh, this progresses. Uh, next point is the X509 document. Uh, from my uh, point of view, uh, there is only one issue that uh, will not be addressed with uh, the pull request uh, from John, pull request 35. Uh, that pull request should address uh, issues 23, 29, 30, 31, and 33. Uh, there is uh, one issue 13 that is uh, I think uh, reference to an IANA registry which I guess is a trivial editorial change that I would do and uh, the issue 36 is about the support of uh, beast, uh, byte strings uh, for encoding uh, certificates uh, so I think uh, was uh, saying that this had some additional um, code to the implementation. Uh, so there was the question whether it makes sense to uh, to keep this uh, this option. Uh, Ben and has pointed out that at this stage uh, it might be a little bit more uh, difficult change to do, although still, of course, possible. Uh, from my point of view, we have already been uh, having in other places variations where we encode elements either as an array or if there is a single element as a byte string. Uh, so this uh, shouldn't be something surprising for implementers. And uh, I don't believe we should change that. If anyone has any other opinion, please share them. Yes. Or comment on the issue if you prefer. Yes, John. Yeah, yes. I I worked some on the PR thirty five today. I comment on I think Ben's comment on that PR were mostly misunderstandings from Ben's side. So I don't really think there's any need for changes. And then there is a discussion with uh, Michael Richardson and Lawrence Lundblade regarding must or should and what what COSI should protect you from. I think that's a more trickier issue to uh, to mm -hmm. resolve. It's more opinions how much COSI should protect you from and what you can assume from the CA and so on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess those are discussions on the mailing lists. Uh, on the mailing list. I will take a look at that. Okay. Uh, well, with that, I think we can uh, go to the next slide. Ah, yes. So, uh, well, the Cozy Cibor encoded certificate is now uploaded. Uh, the repository is moved to this location. 
and uh, uh, the oven will be presenting some additional slides for this. So, the floor is yours. Is it me or you present, Joran? Yeah, um, I, I, I think you could do it. So, if you want, please do it. Otherwise, I do it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I can present. So, yeah, mm, can take. So, this has been adopted. The new version has been uploaded i think uh, it might have contained some minimal changes from the last document but i think yeah very minimal can take the next slide um, uh, we have also migrated the github repository to the cozy working group github repository uh, when we did that, we tried to close quite a lot of old issues that have already been resolved. Uh, then there are some changes. And I think that one change that we made was the realization that the, the draft did not refer to deterministic seaboard, meaning that you could actually encode the integers in a lot of different ways. So an update that is also in the last submitted version is that there is a new text stating that whenever CBOR is used, it's always deterministic CBOR, referring to the CBOR or the, the relevant section of the CBOR RFC. Uh, then we changed the name of the data structure. They were previously called CBOR certificate and CBOR certificate Type. They are now called C509 certificate. Uh, and uh, now the whole document is updated to, to be C509 C because there was a comment that we should not call it CBOR certificates. I don't know if the group is happy with the name C509. There's been no objection against it, but I think if we want to change it to something else, we should decide that now or pretty soon. Uh, Michael Richardson says he can live with C509. Um, good, then uh, a question to the working group. I think when the charter was uh, in the late, stages of the charter restructuring in ISG. Uh, there was an addition that uh, COSI might work on double sign certificate. So that is both the sign two signatures, one over there and one over CBOR. Um, I think that was added by Ben, if I understand it correctly. Now Ben is not here would be would be interesting to discuss uh, exactly what the use case would be for this and how it would help before we start to structure uh, that i guess it would be a new type of c509 certificate um is there anybody in the group that has any views on double sign tickets? Well, the, the obvious use case is that <clears throat> you, you are doing some process with uh, both non-constrained and constrained environments. <clears throat> and the non-constrained environment, some HSMs that, that only can uh, verify X509 signatures and uh, 
the constraint devices actually want to stay on the SIBO side of things. So having both signatures in there uh, may be a good way to to uh, cover this continuum. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would prefer if we made this as painless as possible uh, to do. Uh, so you you can just uh, have one or the other or both and and uh, things is uh, uh, it's easy to have them because <clears throat> in the end uh, the, the certificate is the it, it's content uh, plus signatures and in in the end it, it doesn't really uh, matter from a, um, a security point of view which kind of uh, signature you you have. Uh, so it should be able, it should be easy to to add both if you actually get them. So I think yeah. there's another side to it, which I understood when you wrote double assigned cert certificates, which was not at all what Carson just said. Um, and that is that in lamps, there is some process about to start with uh, having both post quantum signatures and legacy signatures and some of the pros some of the ways that this is proposed to do essentially look like auxiliary data in a the legacy certificate um and so that's what i thought the word double sign certificates meant um and um so uh maybe i've just suggested there's triply signed certificates now um so um i don't know how that fits into the space of this but i don't think we should did I get this right? That this is essentially a counter signature type. So, uh, so, so it's not the same signature. It, it's uh, the signature actually means something different. Uh well, so you're going to have to um, spend some time uh, uh, puzzling through the documents, as I am. But effectively, there's uh, one proposal that says that the same CA will sign. Uh, both um, legacy and post quantum public keys with both and will sign it with a legacy and a post quantum um, uh, signature. Um, another way says there's two ships in the night and that the post quantum CA signs the post quantum part and the legacy part sends the legacy thing. Um, and then there's several different proposals as to how to represent this in this in the X509. Uh, in the thing uh, process, um, with with one of them being there's completely separate certificates for the two things, and the other one is that the the data is mixed together using various kinds of extensions. Um, and I I can't say to you I can't say which one is the dominant uh, choice right now because I'm not sure anyone understands that. Um, and there's some good presentations in the archives uh, from the last. In the previous lamps meeting, um, and if it makes your head spin, uh, mine too. Yeah. I'm. Uh, I don't really understand why the post quantum algorithm update would be handled different than any other algorithm up update we have done in the past, like MD five to show one. So, to so, so that's two. that's one of the arguments. That's one of the yeah. arguments. It's just another algorithm. What's the problem? And the issue is that um, it turns out that people are saying, yeah, but I don't know how to process the new certificates yet, yet I want to issue them. So you want to have both signatures in each sig certificate specifically so that the older devices can continue to do something um, and, and that we don't know at what point some long-lived certificate is suddenly going to become um, um, uh, in, uh, 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 forgeable um and that way so so that's part of the consideration is that it's not just an algorithm change and um um that's why i suggest you wa watch the videos i think we're going to have more than one solution coming out of this so the, the question uh, that really comes to mind is uh, whether these signatures are actually the the same or whether they need different metadata um, in in design part to actually describe them, and when they need different metadata, then <clears throat> you would essentially have to partition the signature between the the parts that are common and the parts that are different, and uh, that that is going to become unwieldy. 
it does not uh, it doesn't make my head spin it makes my uh, stomach revolt uh, the idea of more than one signature on a certificate especially if you uh, consider the uh, sizes of uh, post quantum keys and signatures uh, seems pardon my strong language absurd well, I, not all I, of them are I, not all I, of the post quantum or the quantum safe signature algorithms are actually bigger some of them are smaller um but some of them may be bullshit right so um we don't know yet I, i'm 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 considering those that uh, are in the nist around 3 the I finalists think, i think rainbow is very small but have huge public keys so the certificate would be i think this picnic level one signature are 64 bytes but the public keys are several hundred thousand bytes yeah. I, so yeah, the argument uh, wait wait, wait. Um, let me finish please my my point is uh saying well we want to produce certificates which we do not quite know how to process yet sounds like i want to uh, i do not know how to fly an airplane but i want to be an uh, airline pilot now if 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 you need legacy for now and, and post quantum for later do that because the likely sizes especially uh, since the signature usually is the at least for post quantum it would dominate the size of the cert for classic well arguable are you talking rsa are you talking elliptic curve are you talking elliptic curve over p256 or are you talking rsa uh, uh 4096 or bigger yeah. Anyways, yeah. you you need uh, certificates for different processing. Get two certificates, and uh, this would uh, alleviate the risk that on a double signed certificate, for example, the classic part is forged, and now you have a cert with uh, one signature fine, another signature not, and. If you can process only one of the two, how are you going to tell the difference be between uh, fake and uh, honest? So I, I, I see what Goran uh, put uh, in the chat. Yes, the, the charter suggests exploring. And I would say the exploration shows it's uh, more risks and inconveniences than benefits. So could I add something there? So yeah, I mean the, the charter. I think the charter talks about exploring, but it's also uh, clear what I think what what it what is going to be what should be explored, if anything, and that's um, that you have this sort of the same setup, same keys, same. Um, same parameters, but you include both the signature over the seaboard and the signature over the daring coding. That that that's what the charter speaks about. And I think there are, there are many interesting <laughs> ways to expand this. But but I think the question particularly was raised by Ben was was this thing because this is his words in in the charter, as far as I can say. And. Uh, um... The, the main reason to use Cibor, as I said in chat, is its uh, smaller size. How is uh, there going to arrive at the recipient? Are you sending it uh, together with Cibor? Then it completely doesn't make sense. Do you expect the recipient to re encode the Cibor in there? And then validate the signature. Yes, that's exactly how it's in. That's type type one. That's sort of reencoding in there. 
So, and I think your idea with having an an, uh, an option to strip off the constraints, uh, the um, the their encoding that 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 makes sense, I think. But perhaps we should wait for Ben to see with more more in detail what he is, what he had in mind here. Uh, yeah, my question on this slide was: my understanding is that it would be a CBOR certificate with CBOR encoding only, and what would be added is the original signature, so it will be would be sixty four bytes larger, and. My understanding would be that the, this would be an optional expansion of the current draft, so nothing that you do on by default. But I'm I'm not sure it's worth doing. But Karsten seems to think it had use cases. Um, maybe we should agree. To I think the next part of the discussion should, if we explore this further, the next part should maybe be more explicit um, details on, on how this could be used, but also use case discussions why it should be used then. Uh, yes, so maybe we can uh, try to have this discussion also on the mailing list, uh, but yes, what I hear is that uh, while writing this, there were some uh, considerations uh, that we might need to support at least at first, both uh, uh, in signing the their equivalent of the CBOR encoded certificate or uh, the CBOR certificate itself, and uh, I think part of the uh, reason was also to have simpler parsing on the device, not only the size of the of the messages, uh, but that will be maybe cleared out during the discussion, is hopefully in the main list, and uh, yes, let's. Let's try to, I can try to write some uh, summary of the discussion here and we can uh, try to see what would be the best way to uh, go forward with this, whether it, it makes sense to support it only in some cases, what would be the cases, etc. Yeah, I think it sounds great to have a discussion on the mailing list. Uh, let's continue now when the document is adopted and the document is currently registering a new TLS certificate type. Uh, so I have requested uh, time from the TLS chairs at IETF 111 to shortly describe this to the for the TLS working group. Let's see if we get that acceptable. I think it's essential to collaborate and coordinate with the TLS working group uh, before uh, COSI registers TLS parameters. Maybe the TLS working group, I've, what I heard from TLS people seems that they seem interested in this, so I assume that will be the case. It might be that the TLS working group has comment, might be that the TLS working group would like the doc, uh, TLS working group document to do this registration. Could also be that the TLS working group does not want this registration at all, even if I don't think that will be the case. But um, uh, And that is basically the current updates. Then the next slides are about um, sending RPK by value. This was brought up in the Lake Working Group. Lake Working Group, as you probably know, is designing the ad hoc key exchange protocol. And ad hoc is very heavily relying on COSI for basically everything, both crypto and to identifying certificates and so on. And one of the 
things in the lake requirement document is to uh, include them that the initial focus should be on RPK by value. This was recently brought up uh, again by Christian Amsus on in the lake working group interim meeting that this needs to be done. And there has also been several industrial partners that we know of that thinks this is an important use case. So EDOC currently relies on COSI to transport and identify credentials. It uses all the COSI header parameters, KID, the X5 parameters, or the C5 parameters. Uh, ed RPK by value should hopefully also be uh, done with the COSI uh, header parameters if the COSI working group thinks this is a uh, acceptable ID. Uh, when thinking about this, we came up with two main options. Uh, one is to use a cozy key. Uh, this is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and this other is to use a C509 certificate, but stripping the issuer and the issuer signatures. Uh, and these have roughly the same size, uh, but they have slightly different properties, pros and cons. Um, can go to the next slide. So can, can I quickly ask a question? Um, when you say RPK, do, do you mean RFC 7250 or do you mean the concept of a raw public key? I mean the concept of a raw public key. Thank yeah. you. And maybe not so raw either, uh, as we will see. Yeah. But the but, public key that is not a certificate. But Carsten, your question is, is well, well put and, and timely because one of the solutions uh, is that we do like in RFC 7250. Basically strip off the signature of, of, of certificate structure. Yeah, and we, we should be able to do that today, right? But I, yeah, but we don't want to use. I assume uh, I assume that's the T TLS RPK RFC you're referring to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that that of course uses a X509 Darren code structure that we definitely don't want. It also strips away everything except the raw public key, and it's not not sure we want to strip away that much either. Yeah. So in, in the COSI world, are we talking about proof of possession keys? Or um, I mean, there, there are already structures for that. Yeah, not in COSI itself, I guess, not to send it on the wire. OK, I I'm, don't have this off the top of my head. Yeah. What are you, are you referring to? Yeah, maybe some uh, web tokens, or is that what you refer to? Or eight seven four seven. I don't know what. Uh, so let's uh, le let me continue with the slide. We can discuss. So what Jaren and I uh, discussed for for ad hoc was uh, so far we have looked at cozy key or stripped down C509 that could be differently stripped down. Positive things with cozy key is that it's uh, available in cozy implementations. If you have cozy, you have that. It's not designed for transport on the wire, but it could, of course, be fixed. Uh, there's currently a new header parameter to send to use it by value. You can refer to it by a kid, but that uh, necessary. Then you need to have it in your on your side beforehand. Uh, Cozy key only supports a limited amount of key ops. There have been 
does not uh, support, I think, the key usage um, uh, for the Diffie-Hellman key derivation and also has been discussion that ad hoc would maybe need some dedicated uh, key usages or key ops. Uh, Cozy key does not include additional functionality that is available in the certificate, like validity and subject name. It can dis be discussed whether these are needed or not. Uh, if you want to align with the Sigma protocol specification, then you need to have a subject name. That's uh, I, my understanding is that that's stated as a must in like um, that's something that the Sigma protocol have. So if you start to remove that, then you can be questionable if you are Sigma or not. And then validity and key usage seems to be could be useful also for a raw public key or a public key. I don't know if it's raw if you include these. It's not a certificate. Benefits with C509 is that ad hoc will, a lot of ad hoc implementation will use C509 certificates anyway. We have seen interesting implementations of that. So using both C509 and COSI key has some negative implementations, then you will need to support two completely different key formats, which cause additional code, and maybe that you need to register key ops EQ extended key usage twice. Uh, then the following slides shortly show some examples on how these public keys look like in these two variants. Can I take next slide? Uh, so here's an easy example of a cozy key with a point compressed E. Uh, 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 maybe the curve is wrong here, but this is a com point compressed EC2, it should illustrate. Uh, next slide. Uh, and here is an example of how a slightly uh, slimmed down version of C509, uh, the, in the CDL here, the issuer and the issuer signature algorithm and the issuer signature is removed. And you have something looking like on the right here. This is the example uh, signature, example certificate with these fields removed. And we can take next slide. Um, and then you could, of course, I you could use them with just nulling them. Then you end up with the left, or you could, if we determine that um, key usage and validity and, and so on is not, uh, and subject name is not necessary for the raw public key, uh, then it will look something like on the right. Um, uh, and then there was comment from the comment from Karsten to use, I don't know if it was eight, seven, four, seven. Um, I guess that would be a third proposal compared to this. Yeah, I don't want to muddy the water, but I think we should have at least demonstrate that we have looked at this thing and consciously decided against mm -hmm. it. Uh, yeah. But then we, that does not have a header parameter either. So if you want to use CWTs as a, um, RPK by value, then you would need to register a header parameter for that. Yeah. I have not looked at using CWT, so I think that's a good input. Mm. And, and there's also some need for canonicalization, I suppose. In this case. So I don't know if there are any more slides. No, that's the, the end of the presentation.
So I don't know what, what does the COSI working group um, think about defining a, a, a way to send the RPK by value? I guess the COSI either it would be a separate draft defining a COSI key by value or a CWT by value. If it's the C509 alternative here, that would easiest be defined in the C509 draft. Uh, another alternative would be that Lake Working Group uh, do a registration uh, like this. Um, and we will discuss this more in Lake also uh, later, but we wanted to discuss this first in the Coast Working Group, but I think the expertise for this is here. Mm. And this is very much cozy. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me as well that uh, that could belong to the cozy working group. Uh, of course, we need to discuss that also with uh, Ben and uh, uh, I don't know if Mike has any other opinion, but at first glance that that's sounds it could belong here. The other point is, of course, uh, having the consensus that this is something we want to be working on. Uh, so, yes. Well, my question is, are there real use cases for this? If so, we could consider it. Um, I'd like to see like a paragraph or two write up on the mailing list saying why we would want to do this and what use cases would be satisfied. Okay, let's, let's start that thread. Yeah. But the, the use case would be like, opportunistic you you get your key on first use like in ssh that's what we are hearing from some uh, industries wanting to use in this in their dog so maybe christian you have use cases i don't know if you want to um, describe your use case if you want to wait until the main discussion mm -hmm. I think there are basically several ways of doing this, but when there, it's probably easy to argue that uh, for certain use cases, we need to transport the raw public key, like, like the example John gave here. What, what is more difficult is to say what exactly what, which option should we go for, because there are more than one. And um, yeah, and, and then there is this slide with the different pros and cons where, where we can argue, uh, add arguments to. Oh, Christian is now answering, I think, in the chat. The other question I've got is, and this is partly for Evo, but really for Ben, does this does doing this require a charter modification? I don't know. I don't think we have an AD on our call.
Yes, I think we'll have to discuss this with Ben from uh, from memory. I think that would need the rechartering, uh, but uh, we need to verify this and discuss with Ben. Okay, uh, are there some other comments on this or maybe we can uh, be discussing the uh, future of the Java implementation? So I, as long as we've got a little time, I'm going to ask what people on the call think of the uh, possible representations. There's the uh, bear option, there's the CWT option. Why would we choose one or the other? All right, well, hearing nothing, um, maybe that question should be asked on the mailing list as well. Okay, so uh, are there any opinions about the future of the COSI Java implementation? Uh, I believe uh, yes, Richard can... might, yes. Yes, maybe I can say a few words since I kind of triggered this discussion. So basically there is under the COSI working group uh, part there under GitHub, there is an implementation of COSI in Java, which is hosted there on GitHub, um, let's say in the folder of the COSI working group. And this is the implementation that Jim Shad created and, and maintained. <clears throat> and we're actually using that in an implementation of ACE and also we're using it for OS core functionality. And the problem is, I would say two. Uh, number one is, is there anyone that can kind of take over from Jim and maintain this code and uh, accept incoming pull requests. Now I, I reached out to Ivaido and he could accept one pull request I created there, which was very nice, but I guess there is a need for a more long-term solution. So the code maintenance is one question. The second question is that this Cozy Java library, it's also released on Maven as a Maven project. And that's typically how we use it as a third party library through Maven. So there is also a need for someone to regularly release new versions of the Cozy Java library onto Maven. Because now, even though I managed to get my pull request accepted to the, to the Java code, if that's not released, if the latest version is not released as a, as a Maven project, we can't really link and use that as a third party library in ACE, for instance. Um, so I guess the question is generally, how can this is also, I see like we're using it for some projects and all, if I look at Maven, there are other projects using this code. So it would be a shame if it um, kind of 
went away or if, if no one took it upon them to continue uh, developing this code since it's used here and there. So that's basically the question, like, what's the plans for the future for this code that uh, with Jim Schad's uh, unfortunate passing, is there any plans on how this can be continued to, to be maintained? How can it live on and how can it be released regularly onto Maven, etc.? Well, Ricardo, I think you've just found yourself a job. <laughs> um, I, actually, I think that you should fork it on GitHub to a repo that uh, an, an organization you control. And I actually think we should mark that code as archived in our re repo and point it someplace that elsewhere. Um, because I don't think that uh, as a working group, we have responsibility or authority to figure that out. Mm -hmm. So, so of course, that's one solution that I I, I take it upon myself to make a uh, make a fork, let's say, and then try to transition so that becomes uh, a new official release to some extent. At least we can use it in our own local projects <coughs> um, more easily. I, this is Mike. I agree with Michael that this isn't a working group issue. Uh, there may be interested parties in the working group and related working groups, but I don't think we have authority to decide anything about code. Okay. Okay. So the recommendation is that it, this is not a, a task that this is the responsibility of the working group, like you said, or, or under the authority of the working group. So. The current code there in the in the GitHub of the working group can be marked as archived, and then if anyone wants to continue to use this, it's more up on them themselves to to fork it and manage that on their own. Unfortunately, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that doesn't mean that I think that postings to the working group mail list saying that you're doing this and other people are unwelcome, but um, that's uh, really it. Sure, sure. Of course, that can yeah. be. Uh... I agree with that. It's perfectly fine to inform people of things that are happening in implementations related to working group output, but it's not a working group project per se. Okay, let, let us think a bit on our side, and then if we decide to to do this act and and fork it, uh, we can send a, a post to the uh, mailing list to announce this that. We will try to let's say take over this code in a sense. Okay, thanks for the input. Okay, is there any other business? Hey, um I have one similar to the to this discussion on on the GitHub repo. There's an examples uh, cozy examples project, um, and I was just wondering how that's being maintained. Um, for instance, I've had pull requests sit there since December. Um, is that plan to be maintained by the working group, and who reviews and accepts those pull requests? Well, the working group doesn't uh, create uh, products like that, um, but uh, I think it, it's still something that people in the working group can be interested in uh, maintaining. Um, so uh, I think th this is a case where where this is close enough to what we are doing on our documents, where we also need examples. Um, I think these examples actually are in 8152 bis, so we would uh, be uh, uh, well served by keeping this uh, code alive uh, in case we ever need to update uh, that. So I think it's a slightly different from from the uh, Java code case. So I actually, for instance, I actually import that examples into my code as a sub module uh, to run my tests against. So um, um, I don't know what your pull request is, but I'll certainly look at it. Um, I don't know how we can achieve um, Authority, authority on this well, but I think this is perhaps within the working group to decide. 
Just Mike, I also agree that this is within scope. It kind of reminds me of RFC 7520, which was Jose examples, which our own Matt Miller wrote in 2015, that that was considered important enough to interoperable adoption that it was published as an RFC. In our case, we've published examples in our RFCs. And given that this is an input to our RFCs, I think it's worth maintaining. So we need to find someone who wants to be curator of it. We have that uh, GitHub summary thing that sends us weekly, the mailing list weekly um, summaries of activity. Do we have that running for the COSI? I don't think this is configured uh, right now, but uh, okay. yes, we can do it if, if that would if, be of interest. If we did that and we added the examples to the list, that would probably be useful because then things like pull requests that were sitting there for six months would, would show up in the summary and um, maybe we'd get some upvotes or something. Michael, could you maybe ask to have that done? I'll, I'll find... Yeah, um, I'll ask on the list. And I think Matt Miller is the one with the expertise to do it. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, Spencer did it for the working group that he and I are co-chair, and I am blissfully ignorant. Thank you. Another... Admin thing while we're running out of time. I forgot to link the CBOR certificate, the C509 certificate draft, the working group draft, and the individual draft. Uh, is there something US chairs can do, or is it something I should do? So that the the chairs can, can do that, uh, or you can send a message to the secretariat and they will do that manually. That's usually, usually the easiest way to fix up things like that. Okay, so I'll send a mail to the secretariat. Yeah. Okay, any other topics? I guess we are more or less out of time, but if you have any other things you would like to discuss, please uh, also share on the mailing list. Yeah, once the meeting is over, Ivaro, I, I again have to talk to you about <laughs> that meeting we are still trying to set up. Sure. Okay. So, again, that's all. Thank you, everyone, for the participation. Uh, please take a look at the minutes uh, once they are published and uh, see you again in about a month. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.